Damn, I wish I could read. So I reinstalled Oblivion recently, logged into Nexus, began compiling a list of necessary mods, you know, the usual thing one does, but then I remembered something. Wasn't there like a big, huge German mod slash total conversion of Oblivion that everyone liked? I remember reading about it on Something Awful in like 2010 or 2011. Nerim. 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 Yeah, Nerim. The game already got a sequel, Anderol, based on Skyrim engine and assets. It appears to be a series with a loyal fan base. The subreddit got a bunch of upvoted posts. This is a masterpiece. Anderol is an RPG classic like New Vegas. And Nerim wasn't even the first game. There is an even lesser known project, a total conversion of Morrowind called Arctwind, released back in 2006. Maybe we'll check it out at some point. But today, we'll be exploring Nerim at Fate's Edge. The main menu theme is a lullaby. That's a curious choice. The game opens with a quote from Faust by Goethe, followed by a Beethoven quote. Perhaps Nerim will complete the system of German idealism. The story setup is this. We used to live and study in an abbey, until one day we received a mysterious letter. The instructions in the letter led us to a seemingly abandoned mine on the kingdom's border. Nerim is the name of the continent the game takes place on, by the way. Let's make a character. There are three races to choose from. Eterna are gifted magic users and a persecuted minority. Eleman are the largest tribe on the continent and Norman are the local equivalent of Nords. The description says they are nomadic and that there aren't a whole lot of them in Nerim. So let's make a Norman, I suppose. I have no idea what a believable Nerimese name sounds like. As soon as we get into the mine, the floor collapses below us. We meet another idiot who also received a letter. It was a trick, a trap, he says. The mine is infested with trolls and other dangerous creatures. I pick up a starter dagger and we are ready to explore. The game is using one of the popular Oblivion inventory mods, so you don't have to deal with vanilla list-based inventories, which were obviously made with console usability in mind. This thing dead? I hope so. A very impressive underground structure. Hmm, what's the level of technology in this game? That doesn't really look medieval. There is no ambient music in this section. Contributes to the creepy atmosphere. We kill our first enemy, a troll. They're big, but honestly kind of pathetic. There are many side paths to explore. Ooh, a puzzle? Now we are thinking with portals. Supposedly Nerim is similar to the Gothic series of games, another German franchise, very liked by RPG nerds. There is a reason for that. The reason being they're goddamn good games. I imagine this guy also received a letter. The mines are... expansive. The RPG system of Nerim borrows a lot of elements from the Elder Scrolls. The skills improve as we keep using them, but the rate of improvement is several times slower than in Oblivion. This is augmented by a traditional XP system. Kill enough things and you'll gain a level. Every level gives you a bunch of skill points to distribute, but in order to spend them you need to find trainers and pay them money. Skill points can also be acquired by finding hidden collectibles like this book over here, a reward for exploration. It appears the mine, the facility is still operational, so the monsters are a recent thing? We are ambushed by a troll and our body dies in a scripted scene. Normal trolls are pushovers. This thing is a special invincible troll. You are not supposed to fight it. We are running away, it's a chase sequence. We escape the troll by taking a tram ride. The prologue suffers heavily from what someone in the Morrowind modding community called Modder's Megalomania. Everything is huge, the whole thing lasts five times longer than it should, and we are introduced to various mechanics that are not actually present in the main game. The way to kill the troll permanently is by doing this torch puzzle. It's mandatory in order to progress, but the whole thing is barely a puzzle. All you need to do is click on four of these log things. I am only mentioning this because someone in Steam reviews wasn't able to figure it out and downvoted the game in frustration. 
Look at that, there is a tavern inside the mine? That's actually super cool. Too bad inside it's mostly empty. Beware of what, trolls? They're trash. A creepy corpse with a hook hand. Was this guy a pirate? The dead body in the campfire comes back to life and we have to click it until it dies again. Another letter, victim. We are getting closer to the surface, finally. A mysterious man in a wizard garb is murderizing mass numbers of trolls. His name is Merzul. He's a mage, an archmage, whatever. He explains why we're here. The letters were not meant to lead us into a trap. That was all an accident. Instead, they were meant to gather individuals with a rare ability to do magic all in one place and then press gang them into joining a secret organization of wizards. Magic is a forbidden gift, you see. Merzul explains that the invitation is not an optional kind of thing. The knowledge of the existence of the Magus' secret cabal can't reach the outside world. Unfortunately for Merzul, nobody with an oblivion face looks intimidating. Oh, whatever, I'm just happy to finally get out of the mine. Freedom at last! Holy crap, the world map is huge! It's easily oblivion-sized. For all I know, it might be bigger. We need to make our way to the Major Sanctum. But first, we should stop by our former home, the Abbey. That's what the main quest says. I forgot how funny the paralyzed effects in Oblivion were. We find a merchant and sell all the meaningless crap we accumulated in the mine. The guard informs us that we are stuck in this little valley. We need to do more tutorial quests before we are allowed to leave. Safe to say this entire introductory sequence is worse than Oblivion's. And it's not even over yet. We are going back to the mine! Jesus Christ! The foreman, or whoever this guy is, wants us to kill a bunch of rats. Then we help a moron miner take off the helmet that got stuck on his head. It's a fetch quest. Then we do some more nonsense busy work for someone else. Looking at this footage, I don't even remember what I was doing here. Eventually the situation resolves itself when the guards are attacked by terrorist mages. I hope these are not the same mages we're supposed to be joining. Actually, never mind, I hope they are the same. It's a huge battle, by the Elder Scroll standards anyway. I think the tutorial NPCs are invincible, so there is no real tension. After all that, we are finally free to go and explore the world. I love the music. Eventually we reach the Abbey. Ich will keinen Ärger. The place offers a number of services. This guy sells skill books on skinning, talent removal, heart extraction and other hunting related crap. But I'm not into any of that shit. I love animals. This notice has surprisingly little text. Maybe this is the game's way of communicating that our character is illiterate. After accidentally reading the same notice twice, this message popped up. If we read a hundred books, we'll get an intellect bonus. Oh yeah? You are dealing with an intellectual. One of the Abbey people wants us to go hunting goblins with him. Says he'll teach us something about marksmanship after we're done. I accept, since I already have a build in mind. Get this, guys. We're gonna be an archer, but with stealth. We bullshit the person in charge of the Abbey that we've been drafted into the army and have to leave. He does the Caius thing, saying that we probably should do some exploring first and work some jobs or whatever. The goblin problem is solved by planting explosives in the goblin cave. Getting real sick of caves. In the chest, next to our bed in the abbey, we find this map. Supposedly, as a child, we buried something on a little island not far from here and then uh, completely forgot what it was? That's not super amazing writing. I don't think our character is supposed to have amnesia or anything. We might just be stupid. Well, that was before we got well read. 
This little rare plant gives a permanent bonus to luck when consumed. Exploration, both on the overworld and inside dungeons, is fantastically rewarding in Nerim. You always end up with a magical item, a collectible, or a little permanent bonus. Here it is, an old dagger. The hilt is engraved with the name of the person who forged it, the smith from a place called Stonefield, not far from here. Wh what are you doing, guy? You dropped something? Mage terrorism seems to be a common problem in the kingdom. Are we the baddies? I have so many questions. If you have a shovel in your inventory, you can loot graves, like in Fallout 2. Stealth Archer, proof of concept. I suppose we should visit Stonefield before we go on with the main quest. Oh look, it's one of them Oblivion-style ruined forts. It must have been 10 years since I last explored one of those. I slay the bandits inside using the expert tactic called Kiting. Random NPCs in this game love talking racist shit about the Eterna people. And this is Stonefield. Took me a while, but this was where I noticed the lack of a certain feature that I really like in my RPGs. The NPC barks. You know, like these. Emperor, King and Justice, citizen. Uh, come on then, say something or move on. This scent is new. Anytime you're ready, just don't keep me waiting. The Nine and the Empire, citizen. There are no NPC barks in Narium at all. Perhaps this is the reason why the social spaces in this game feel so barren. In Morrowind, Oblivion and Skyrim, you are always drowning My in random NPC so chatter. Good. In Narim, there is just silence. Casting that healing spell was a big mistake. Magic is illegal in the kingdom, sorcerizing in public is punishable by a sizable fee. The town is… well, it looks impressive from a distance, but it's actually tiny with barely any townsfolk or vendors. The blacksmith recognizes the dagger as his and tell us that it was stolen by a homeless boy some years ago. That was obviously us. It seems our original home was a village not far from here that was destroyed in the war or some such calamity. The arrogant local local noblewoman tasks us with eliminating the bandits that plague Stonefield. I agree, but we are not actually gonna do that. Instead, we'll rob her house. Although there is barely anything here for us to take. The vanilla Oblivion had this problem as well. The stealth mechanics overall are superior to Morrowind's, but the upgrade ends up being meaningless, because there is almost no good loot to steal. Peasants working the fields. That's cool. The village of Gilead. I like it, it's moody or something. The guard has an amazing looking helmet. Love the design. The local entrepreneur attempts to sell us a donkey. No thanks. Awesome. So the combat is uh, not great. Is Vanilla Oblivion also this janky? We fight a mage terrorist in this game's equivalent of Alien Ruins. I can't kill him because he keeps healing himself and he can't kill me for the same reason. The combat feels very floaty and the HP bloat is insane. Was Oblivion also this bad? Nerim doesn't use level scaling. Instead, each major geographical area has enemies within a certain level range. Wait a minute, there are signposts showing the way to the secret mage's sanctum? Wait, there are public roads leading to the secret sanctum? Well, this is the place. We speak to the mage lady, she informs us that the organization we were drafted into is called The Order. The sanctum is a home for people gifted with a talent for spellcasting. Mages are persecuted everywhere else in the kingdom. In order to join The Order, we must visit the shrine of Naroth Zul Aranthiel, an important figure in the history of the organization. The shrine is not far from here, visiting it is a tradition. The lady sells very important teleport spells. As far as I can tell, these are the only way to fast travel in Nerim. Casting a spell doesn't require much in a way of magical proficiency, but it does use a consumable teleport crystal. You can buy these from merchants and find in dungeons. This is a good and cool approach to fast traveling. We head out to the shrine as instructed. Narath Zul Aranthiel. Everyone in this game has a silly anime name and these don't seem to follow any kind of logical convention and thus are basically impossible to remember. We meet a traveling merchant who gets attacked by random wolves. And that was the last I saw of that man. This is the statue. 
We should read the inscription. And we are transported into some sort of a chaos realm. Willkommen, Schattengeborene. A German woman welcomes us, calling us a Shadowborn. I guess this is one of those Chosen One plots. Is this some sort of a purgatory dimension? Getting Dark Souls 3 vibes. Every character in this engine looks simultaneously very stupid and very serious. We cross a cool rope bridge in space. I admit, all of this looks more impressive than Dagon's Deadlands from Oblivion. But the whole sequence is essentially an interactive cutscene. And in the end, we meet this lady. She explains the metaphysics of this universe. The worlds will be torn apart unless certain natural rules are followed. Then she goes into some teenager philosophy about how things exist in contrast to one another, except for the gods who have no counterbalances and their existence threatens the world's stability on a metaphysical level. And then we are brought back to Narim. I wonder what happened to the wolf guy. I've decided not to tell the cult about the esoteric lady. The Order Sanctum is actually a pretty large city filled with mages. Once again, how the hell is it supposed to be hidden exactly? That tower is clearly visible from half of the world map away. There are fitness trainers here, both martial and magical. The martial arm of the Order are the Templars. That's a very nice selection of armor you got there. The Chaos Woman kept talking about how things can't exist without the opposites, and whatever this condition is, it's like the opposite of the Uncanny Valley. I take advantage of the Scroll of Chameleon we found in one of the caves and steal the Templar steel armor they have lying around. But you know what? To hell with armor. It makes it harder to sneak. In Nerim, any combat challenge that isn't solved with stealth archery is instead solved with either kiting or stun locking. So I'll just roll like this. Too bad the game doesn't have an unarmored skill. Cool. The mages have a palantir kind of device in one of the rooms. I invest most of our learning points into blades and a few into restoration. We are supposed to meet the leader of the order at the observatory at night. He asks us to pick a sign. Each sign is associated with a special ability and two toggleable stances. I pick the villain since I feel it will synergize the best with our stealth archer lifestyle. The cult leader explains the ideology of the organization. The world of Vin is ruled by divine beings known as Lightborn. But actually, he says, they are not divine at all. They're just dudes born with magical powers. The Order is a revolutionary organization created to dethrone the gods, both in Nerim and El Elsewhere. There were successes, the deity ruling over this continent was killed, but then the revolution turned on itself, there was factionalism, infighting, the usual story. The person in charge of the kingdom we are currently in, the one where the magic is outlawed, used to be one of the revolutionary leaders. The cult leader guy is the only character I've seen so far that actually wants to talk to us on the variety of topics. Nerim the game doesn't really have uh, sophisticated dialogue trees. Actually, Actually, it doesn't have any kind of dialogues at all. The next task is finding a woman named Kim in a neighboring village. She, like us, also received a letter, but unlike us, she had the presence of mind to ignore it. We need to convince her to join our moron cult. The village is protected by mercenaries who attack me on sight. Kim is a slave. She didn't go because she was afraid for her life. What follows next is some of the worst quest writing I've seen in my life. Kim's owner lives in a house nearby, but he is unkillable, I've tried. In fact, he is so unkillable that his guards don't even bother defending him. And there is no slave key to pickpocket or anything like that. I checked. So what we have to do instead is follow Kim's incredibly convoluted and frankly stupid plan. Step 1. We sell ourselves into slavery in exchange for the woman. Step 2. We would be taken to the nearby castle for some sort of a initiation procedure. The slaver owns the castle, but he doesn't actually live there, prefers the village lifestyle, I guess. Step 3. Kim, the person we've never met before, knows of a secret entrance, so she will sneak inside the castle and rescue us. Step 4. Together, we flee from the slavers. Why can't we just leave via the unguarded front gate? 
vor der Arbeit kommt das Vergnügen. <laughs> Sei ruhig, verdammt nochmal. So here we are inside the castle's torture chamber, stripped of our equipment. Kim indeed shows up and murders the guards with a bow. She is a stealth archer as well. Maybe that's why we have such good chemistry. We escape. But in order to recover our stuff, we have to go outside the castle for a bit, explore the frozen wilderness, clear a camp of slavers, find the key and then backtrack all the way back to the castle dungeon and finally get back our things. And then, and only then, we can leave this place together with the ex-slave. This is all main quest, by the way. Jesus Christ. The wizard man gives us another mission. One of the letters, yes, it's about the letters again, was sent to a guard living in the capital. A risky move trying to convert a cop and it didn't work. The man never showed up in the mine. We need to infiltrate his house and steal back the letter so it doesn't compromise the operational security of the sanctuary. Although if that's the goal, I'd start with removing the signposts. But since the cop has already read the letter, we need to erase his memory with a spell. An interesting twist. Apparently our spies have been stalking him for some time. We know where he lives, his schedule and the fact that he didn't rat us out yet. The mages have already considered killing the man, but that would attract too much attention, supposedly. Our organization might be malicious, but thankfully we are also incompetent. Look, it's a little Eterna camp by the road. See, not all Eterna are terrorists. Some of them are idiots, just like us. Found a cool sword in one of the dungeons. This is a ghost tree. There was once a dweller hiding inside the tree, frightening travelers. But now, it's silent. The lack of things to steal from the local traders is a big detriment to our lifestyle, but at least we can usually take their potions. These are useful. Tag yourselves, guys. I'm the German Grey Fox. What is the evolutionary advantage of being a red dinosaur? It must have been created with magic. I must say, the evidence that magic use was banned for a good reason just keeps piling up. This Satan-looking enemy might seem menacing, but he is actually pathetic. In fact, all hostile creatures and NPCs in Nerim are easy to kill, except for the ones that have a reach weapon of some kind. You can't easily kite those. For the same reason, a two-handed sword with a huge collision box is one of the best types of weapons you can get in this game. A portal! Let's see what's on the other side. There is nothing. A cave with beautiful purple crystals guarded by elementals. There is used mining equipment everywhere. The miners accidentally dug into the old dwarven ruins. The huge spectral golem guards the treasure. We investigate the little burned down village our character supposedly grew up in. A surprise flashback sequence. We are transported into the past, relieving the traumatic events of our childhood. Who are these guys? We follow them in the dream and discover a secret underground chamber. Now let's go find it in the present. A secret HQ of some kind of a political activist or terrorist organization? These guys, whoever they are, were organizing false flag attacks in order to provoke conflict between various factions. That's how we ended up being a homeless orphan. The next phase of the main quest has us uh, calibrating magical devices or something? I'm not sure, I wasn't listening. It sounded really boring. After we're done, we're sent to talk to our cult leader boss, residing in the Imperial City-esque tower in the middle of the sanctuary. Okay, so this is cool. Our our ultimate task is to rescue what's his face with the with the anime name the statue guy but in order to do that we need to find out where the gods keep him imprisoned so we are going on a journey to the submerged continent of Arctwend in order to search the ruins for a communication device of some sort the lady we previously rescued from the slavers is coming with us the road to the nearest port leads through a mountain pass I love this combination of colors. Kim looks real pissed off for some reason. Let's see what's inside the crypt. Welcome to the bone zone. I think this guy was cooking meth. Kim keeps accidentally hitting us with paralyzed spells while we are in combat. The poor town of 
whatever its name is, protected from wild dinosaurs by constipated guards. This sailor guy informs us that their captain is missing. We need to find him if we want a passage. The local tavern is decorated by a Maroon's Dagon statue, and there is also this thing, whatever it is. The captain was kidnapped by these two morons. Finally, we can go to Arctwend. We find our bunk and rest for a day. So this is the sunken continent. Even has its own separate world map. Impressive. The trees are creepy. The branches look like they could suddenly reach out and grab you. But other than that, the place is not very different from anything we've seen before. Willkommen. Willkommen in meinem Reich, Schattengeborene. As soon as we step inside the tower, we're welcomed by an incorporeal voice, says he doesn't wish us any harm. Eventually, we find what we were looking for, a stone device of some sort that allows us to communicate with uh, what's his name. Apparently, no one spoke with the guy for a very long time, so he is not up to date on the local politics. The order failed to export the revolution past Nerim. The rebellion tore itself apart. One of the leaders turned traitor, the other one is still loyal, but but he's an idiot. You should see what his recruitment plan was. The owner of the previously incorporeal voice shows up. He is dressed in an over-designed suit of armor that looks like it was ripped from a late 2000s Korean MMO. The guy explains that the revolution failed because of his soldiers. But he doesn't actually like the gods much these days. I'm not sure what they're talking about, I stopped listening. The Korean armor guy accuses Lenin of being an incel and the later retorts that he has tons of sex, actually. He instructs us to report that he is trapped somewhere below the ground, and then Alta Force. The other dude says we shouldn't trust Lenin, as the man is power-hungry and thinks only of himself. Then he tells us to get the hell out of his country, and teleports us back to the mage cognitive HQ in Nerim. And just in time, too, the Sanctum is being attacked by state's troops. I guess they finally figured out what road signs were. And so begins the Battle of Bruma. And once again, Nerim outdoes Oblivion by having five people participate in the battle instead of four. Your move, Todd. The cult leadership is hiding in the tower. The rest of the mages are mostly dead, I think. Merzul erects a magical force field on the door. This will stop the bad guys for sure. The mages are toast. We have no future in this kingdom. The plan is to link up with the branch of the order in the neighboring state, and from there we'll continue our search for the incel elf. The bad guy Chancellor shows up, he duels Merzul and easily wins. Our stuff is confiscated again and we are put behind bars, but since we are a wizard with extraordinary powers, we pretty much immediately escape. Our mage companion dominates the mind of one of the Chancellor's soldiers. We will use him to get our equipment back. And here is all the stuff they confiscated. The wizard lets go of our thrall, but paralyzes him just in case. I guess this is our escape route. Well then... There is a huge labyrinth of sewers beneath the prison. We step on a scripted trap, rocks fall and our mage body gets buried alive. He gives us some final instructions and sends us on our way. You know I can get you out, right? We have all our stuff back. I have tons of teleporter crystals. The sewer goblins constructed a religious totem out of garbage. The wheel in the middle is a quest item required for a puzzle elsewhere in the level. Finally, freedom! Ah, <sighs> now we are a wanted fugitive. And our only crime? Membership in a terrorist organization with a proven history of malicious activity. We had West. The local wolves look just like the ones we fought in the beginning of the game, but they have different names and five times as many hit points. Whatever the name of the Western Kingdom is, they are at war with the Chancellor and they are clearly losing. Oblivion's visual assets, its architecture, clothes, landscapes, all are bright and colorful. A lot of green, white and blue attempts to portray the desolation brought by war. They look ridiculous in this engine. Oblivion's aesthetic is often compared to Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, but in reality it's a mix between that and Shrek. 
It's probably the reason why, unlike Morrowind or Skyrim, Oblivion didn't spawn many dedicated decade-long modding projects. Hard to tell a serious story using these goofy assets, but I don't like blaming Nerim's faults on Oblivion. There are many perfectly bad design decisions that have nothing to do with Bethesda. We stumble upon a huge war camp. The soldiers seem to be unaware of our fugitive status. If you talk to them, they bark some racist shit about the Eterna, but otherwise ignore you. Look at that, an elephant or a mammoth. It's super cool. Nerim is alright. The game is very prone to crashing, which is actually not that big of a deal because on a modern system it takes 15 or 20 seconds to boot it up again. But one of the crashes disabled my recording software, something I failed to notice in time. Thought I was recording while I was not. The game is very main quest centric. After playing for 20 hours, I made it about one third of the way through the story. Previously, I suggested that Nerim is like a combination of Oblivion and Gothic. Upon closer examination, it's more like a mix of Oblivion and Diablo. Main quest heavy with a million side dungeons to explore and monsters to click to death. Is this game better than Oblivion? I honestly can't tell. Do I recommend Nerim? Well, um... If you are intrigued by the game's story and can tolerate some of Oblivion's as well as Nerim's own idiosyncrasies, then yeah, go for it. Game's free and it has a heart and a soul, and the gameplay loop is addictive. Back in 2010, this would have been an easy recommendation. The video game industry used to be much smaller. There were fewer games of all kinds, including RPGs. We were not exactly spoiled for choice. Now, a decade later, a lot of things have changed. The industry is now bigger than movies and music combined. There are simply too many games, not enough time to play all the good ones. So with that in mind, I don't think I would bother with Nerim. But it's Skyrim-based sequel? Now that game looks really interesting. Anyway, that's it for now. See you guys in Old Ebonheart in about two weeks.